of Ronda at NerdStalker on Twitter, and you are... Greg Glory, a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter for the NerdStalker Media Network. Hey, man, how's you doing? Good, good. Happy birthday to me, the big 5-0, right? And well, happy birthday. I was like four days behind you, so happy birthday to me, too. So. <laughs> happy birthday to Greg. Yeah. Well, let's shift it back to me. Happy oh, birthday yeah. to Adolfo. It's all about him. <laughs> It's not, yeah. not about me. <laughs> How dare you? Greg, always trying to upstage me, aren't you? Uh, yeah. You will go down. You yeah, will go down. I will go down. But hey, everyone, you know, uh, please uh, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash nerds talker and give us some support. We would love your support. Uh, we work really hard at doing this and we love doing it and we want to do even more of it for you. So, uh, yeah, please check it out. Patreon.com forward slash nerds talker. Absolutely. So let's get into this, huh? Oh. Uh, Pentagon yeah, and documents that, that I've never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah, it sounds crazy, right? So this, this story itself sounds like a conspiracy sort of theory type of thing, but this is reported in Forbes. So uh, you take it from them. This is Billy Bram bro. Billy Bram bro. That's you like him. Uh, so yeah, so the title, as uh, Greg sort of mentioned there, it's Pentagon documents reveal the U.S. has planned for a Bitcoin rebellion. Bitcoin has struggled to find uh, support in the U.S. government with uh, President Donald Trump along to Treasury Secretary uh, Stephen Munchen leading the criticism. Now it's been revealed that the U.S. Department of Defense has wargamed scenarios involving a Generation Z rebellion that uses Bitcoin to undermine and evade the, quote, establishment. Uh, in the Pentagon war game, young people born between the mid-90s and early 2010s use cyber attacks to steal money and convert it to Bitcoin. Documents published by the investigative news site The Intercept revealed called the 2018 Joint Land, Air, and Sea Strategic Special Program, JLAS. The war game is set in 2025 and is intended to reflect a plausible depiction of major trends and influences in the world regions. The scenario, which echoes recent protests in the U.S. and around the world against racial injustice, involves some members of Generation Z who see themselves as agents for social change and believe the system is rigged against them begin a global cyber campaign to expose injustice and corruption and to support causes it deems beneficial. The group called Zbellion <laughs> encourages cyber attacks against organizations that support the, quote, establishment, funneling stolen cash into Bitcoin to make small, below-the-threshold donations to worthy recipient, recipients and Zbellion members. The program, which also reportedly wargamed scenarios involving Islamists, militants, and anti-capitalist extremists, was conducted by students and faculty from the U.S. military's war colleges, the training ground for prospective generals and admirals. Bitcoin has increasingly been adopted by Wall Street and the world's biggest financial institutions since 20, its 2017 price explosion, but remains a tool to fight government control. The Pentagon war game documents have been revealed after Florida Republican Representative Matt Goetz called for the government to freeze the money of demonstrators after countrywide protests over the killing of George Floyd turned violent this month. Quote, one of the most important tools in the authoritarian toolkit is the ability to freeze the funding of legitimate political dissent, unquote. Nathaniel Whitmore, a Bitcoin cryptocurrency consultant and strategist said previously, Quote, by separating the infrastructure, the infrastructure of money from the infrastructure of state power, Bitcoin makes it that much harder for this type of politically motivated confiscation, unquote. Bitcoin has seen a surge in recent months due to the coronavirus pandemic and never before seen levels of government borrowing. Quote, in the wake of unprecedented central bank action around the COVID-19 crisis, it seemed like the most relevant narrative of Bitcoin in 2020 was a hedge against inflation, unquote, Whitmore said. Quote, it appears, however, that this capacity, that its capacity for censorship resistance might be just as relevant, unquote. So really Whoa. interesting that uh, this is coming from Forbes, that these actual Pentagon, <laughs> Pentagon documents reveal that, you know, that the U.S. has been uh, planning for this and running war game scenarios, right, oh uh, against uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin users. Well, I see a movie coming on or something, you know. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Pretty I, wild, this my is man. wild. I, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. It's it not a surprise in a way, too, right? Because right. it seems like uh, uh, the the military would sort of, they, they probably try to plan for all kinds of scenarios all the time 
Yeah, but you know that 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 comment about authoritarianism that that you said about mm. actually taking the money yeah. away from people to kind of disable them essentially. Yeah, you know, right for political dissent too. Yeah. That's scary, yeah. man. Wow. So speaking of uh, some creepiness in technology, more creepiness. <laughs> IBM, what's going on here with those we, guys? Well, thanks to Axios and Ina Freed. We 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 cover her a lot. We read a lot of her articles. Mm -hmm. um, I have, IBM is exiting the face recognition business. So um, in a letter. To members of the Congress uh, just this last Monday, I believe, IBM said it's exiting the general purpose facial recognition business and said it opposes the use of such technology for mass surveillance and racial profiling. Mm. Uh, why this matters, uh, facial recognition software is controversial for a number of reasons, including the potential for human rights violations, as well as evidence that the technology is less accurate in identifying people of color. So um, what, what the president of IBM said is, uh, quote, IBM no longer offers general purpose IBM facial recognition or analysis software, uh, CEO Arvind Krishna said in the letter. IBM firmly opposes and will not condone use of any technology, including facial recognition technology offered by other vendors for mass surveillance, racial profiling, violations of basic human rights and freedoms, or any purpose which is not consistent with the, their value or our values, he says, and principles of trust and transparency of IBM. I, I mean, so. This is interesting. I mean, they've been pushing this AI facial recognition um, thing for a while. I mean, they've sunk yeah. a lot of money into this. And yeah, for them, tons of companies. Yeah, and then I think we just saw just this last week. Um, you know, I think what did what what did um, what did Amazon say? They they, they got suspended for a period of time, I believe. You mm -hmm. know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, everyone's no. doing it, you know, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if this, a lot of the technology has already been <laughs> sold, you know, and they're sort of announcing it now that they're no longer going to be doing this for the time being. Um, but they're all in the business of this, this dirty stuff. Uh, as of today, I know Microsoft just announced that they also are joining in with IBM and all these other ones uh, in not selling uh, this, these controversial technology to police departments until there is a federal law regulating it. Like, like what, what does this mean? Like, what do you feel is like to us as a consumer and using facial recognition like on iOS? I mean, is there is there any concern you have for that with these? Yeah, types of I mean, yeah. yeah, I think it just goes to like just another data point, right? And now they've got like this biological data point, which is kind of creepy in a way, right? When especially adds to all the other sort of, uh, you know, uh, personal preferences that let's say Facebook has on an individual and things like that. Uh, so, I, I mean, it's sort of like, Again, I sort of believe in this whole thing that Joe Rogan has said from the beginning that there's no such thing as privacy, uh, and and in a way, it's you, know, you do want to push back, but it seems like an inevitable sort of uh, rising waters against the dam, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel the same way. Uh, it's I don't know. I mean, some of the things when I, I was just looking at my phone today, and I have the old iPhone 8, so I'm not I'm not where you are yet. Where the actual home button is, is detached, right? It's all, mm. you know, software home button as far as, as far as a physical one. And I was just kind of thinking about that. Like if I had to go total face wreck and like, oh my God, you know. But that, but that being said, you know, a lot of people think that too, but if you've ever used like an Instagram filter or a Snapchat uh, filter on your face, and that was a long time ago before any facial recognition, unlocking your phone stuff, your, your facial data, your, those, you know, data points are already part of some database somewhere, and to think that it's not in the hands of, you know, are being resold and sold and sold and resold is, uh, I think, a bit of a pipe dream. Yeah, let's let's just keep on monitoring that over the next podcast and kind of, you know, seeing what how it unfolds by the end of the year right. or something like that. But okay, let's go on. Electric yeah, block glue. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, so uh, thanks to CNET's uh, Richard Trenholm for this story. Minecraft's Dead Mouse headlined virtual music festival looks bonkers. Dead Mouse, Steve Baoki, and Felix the House Cat joined the lineup of Electric Blockaloo Festival filled with crazy stages. Are you ready to party in Minecraft? Uh, as I mentioned, all these artists will be performing and put hundreds of real life acts onto this phantasmagorical sets limited. Only by your 8-bit imagination. Wave your picks in the air like you just don't care. Taking place June 25th to 28th, Electric Blockaloo is Minecraft's first 
first virtual music festival, featuring a whopping 850 performers on 65 stages. Just like a real festival, you can design your own campsite, and then there are a bunch of features that are very much not like a real festival, taking advantage of the crazy virtual world of Minecraft. So instead of hiking through scorching sun or squelching mud, you hop between stages on a model of the TARDIS from time-traveling TV show Doctor Who and stages, many of which have been conceived by artists, including Red Blocks, a virtual version of the legendary Colorado outdoor arena Red Rocks, and Thunder Mifflin, based on the Dunder Mifflin office from, well, The Office. This is just one of the events taking live music into the virtual world after crowds have been kept away from big events by the coronavirus pandemic. Festivals like South by Southwest and Coachella have been canceled, but more than 20 million people watched Travis Scott perform a spectacular set in the video game Fortnite in April. Dead Mouse is Dead Mouse and Alter Ego Test Pilot lead the newly confirmed acts for Electric Blockaloo, including BBC Radio One host Sherelle, Detroit Legends Craig uh, Carl Craig, Ken Anderson, and Seth Troxler, and house heavyweights Felix the Housecat, Todd Terry, DJ Sneak, Maya Jane Coles, Luciano, and Scream. There are EDM sets from Gal Galantis, Two Friends, Louis the Child, Paris Hilton, ugh, um, <laughs> along, along with previously announced acts, a, a whole bunch more. I'm not going to go into all of them, but there's a ton of them, <laughs> all right? Just so you know. So it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you can buy tickets uh, from your favorite artist through a dedicated link, and the money is split between festival and artists in a 60-40 revenue share. Not only do you get the warm glove supporting your favorite acts, but you also help people and participate in democracy. When you buy your ticket, you can donate your charities tackling pressing issues such as inequality, racism, and clim climate crisis as the, the Ball Project, Black Lives Matter, and Bye Bye Plastic. Uh, while you're at it, you can also register to vote and check out process links non non to nonpartisan initiative headcount. Uh, ticket prices start at $10 for a weekend pass, plus three extra encore weekends to see anything you missed the first time. VIP add-ons start at $15 and include access to extra worlds, stages, artist sets, early arrival, and group camping. And then they have a whole list. We'll include the link of all the, the tons of artists that will be on this thing. It looks like it looks pretty fun. Minecraft. God, that's crazy. I mean, actually, I, I, one thing I'm going to uh, compliment on you, you picked the most articles with tongue twisters for yourself. Yeah, I know, man. Yeah, I know. I'm, a, I'm a glutton for punishment. And I listened to virtually none of those bands, too, by the way. You know, and by the way, you, bands. You, did the, you did the best you did you can. So yeah, I, right. I, I applaud yeah. you. But, but yeah, You're I just, listening to 50-year-old birthday boy here. Oh, I just I'm want sorry. to remind you I'm all. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that, that hit me when you were reading all that to me just now was about um, how digital platforms could, like Minecraft, could really leverage something like this, you know, where... Yeah, right? Yeah, I mean... You they, mean how could they, how they are? Yeah. yeah, how they are, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm kind of surprised, like, Facebook and someone else didn't have these, like, virtual concerts already or, you know, kind of, you know, you know, their yeah, music exactly. is so huge. I, I just... Yeah, yeah. Well, I know in uh, in Facebook they've been doing, you know various artists have been doing these live um, sure. sort of sort of streams like at their home uh, Rufus Wainwright and uh, Chris Martin of Coldplay and all these people that are just like playing out of their home and stuff like that. It seems to be getting a little little bit more formal, um, and and some are even charging now for for that type of stuff. But uh, sure. yeah, this this was kind of neat because this is something like your kids, you know, and yourself, yeah, you know, and it's a game too, you know, in a way. So yeah, yeah it's, it's like fun. It kind of remind me of the uh, you know VR type of stuff that you you know you see with the headsets and stuff like that, but actually bring mm. it to the two D screen, right? So yeah, yeah, that's kind of Fun. cool. Nice. All nice. right, Greg. So uh, let's see. Next one. Would you enjoy having your own enclosed office? Yeah, I you know we we talk a lot about um, culture and and office and stuff like this on this channel. So so anyway, thanks for uh, Mary. Uh, uh, Meisensall um, of uh, Business Insider for this. <laughs> See, yeah, I got a name. I, like I, that I, too. I got one. Yeah, <laughs> shoot. Oh, luckily, I didn't have a triplet like you did last week. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this award winning office design with sealed individual pods is what returning to work could look like. And and uh, you know we'll, we'll be we'll be putting something on this uh, thing. But but basically, for the people who are just uh, listening to us on podcast audio. Um, 
you know, imagine a uh, hexagon <laughs> around a circle and um, you have basically a hexagon cubicle with basically HEPA filter fans on top of you that you basically walk in almost like a phone booth, if I could Ooh, actually cool. just say, and basically that's your own workspace and you enter in by facial recognition. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> we of were course. just talking about yeah. that. Of course. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. of course. You couldn't do it with, uh, you know, fingerprinting. Oh, right. No touchy, know. touchy. Yeah, yeah okay. right. So, um, so one of the things is white collar employees around the world would suddenly begin working remotely in mass as the coronavirus pandemic closes offices. Um, well, while workers are already asked to return in some states, offices and hotspots are working on potential solutions for offices that make social distancing difficult. So designer Mohammed Radwan prototype adds hexagonal pods and air purifiers to office. So, so. Uh, the, the neat thing about it, let me, let me see if I can get down to a part where it kind of describes it in a little more detail for you. So, you know, here kind of how it works. Um, let's see. Of course it doesn't work. <laughs> no worries. I'll edit so, all this out. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, what happens is that, you know, you, you basically run into the, each pot is like a cubicle. Um, it's sealed off from other employees. So you run to the office, you go into your cubicle, and basically, actually, what happens is that if it's your own environment, they're making the argument you don't have to clean it as much. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Is that okay. weird? Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Uh, your boss gets a double hexagon where you get a single hexagon. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of like, you know, yeah, <laughs> extrapolate sure. this, right? Because, you know, if you go back to the old cubicle design where, where we, we announced, you know, about a month ago when we talked about that the open office uh, layout is dead, right? Yes. Isn't this is crazy? This is nuts, man. Isn't it? We're going back. I, I, it's so I was about to say, man, we're going back yeah, to the cubicles, but not only that, they're kind of like coffins in a way, right? So you yeah, guys are yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. And I think this is like a, this is like Brazil the movie or something. <laughs> Yeah, teeny room with a door, you know what I mean? Oh, well, so and, and, and it remind me of, uh, I, you know, I, I used to go to Japan a lot, the capsule hotels in, in, in yeah. Tokyo, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, the capsule hotels kind of well, a little bit more open, but this is really a tight capsule, right? But I mean, the capsule hotels yeah. are almost kind of like um, those um, sleeping berths in a train. Right, right. You know, right? Yeah. Anyway, Very nice. thank you. Very nice. Oh, wow. All right. I think it's speed rail? <laughs> speed rail. Speed rail. Speed rail. Speed rail. Speed rail. All right. So uh, thanks to, uh, let's see, what is your name? Ben Coxworth from the New Atlas for this particular story. Aquify could bring Wi-Fi-like tech to the underwater world. Uh, <laughs> so radio waves travel poorly through water, it turns out, which makes it difficult for divers and submersibles to wirelessly transmit information to the surface. Scientists are trying to change that through, uh, to change that, though, by developing under, an underwater version of Wi-Fi. Back in 2018, we heard how researchers at Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah University of Science and Technology has used lasers to transmit HD video through water. Their, their experimental new system, known as Aquify, builds on that technology. A user such as a scuba diver would start by sending data from a smartphone contained in a watertight housing. That data would initially be transmitted in the form of radio waves going just a few feet to a small device mounted on the drivers, I mean the divers air tanks. A microcomputer in that device would then convert the data into a series of ultra rapid light pulses, each pulse representing either a one or a zero in binary code. Those pulses would subsequently be emitted towards the surface using either an integrated 520 nanometer, la nanometer laser or an array of green LEDs. The LEDs would send the data relatively short distances using little power, while the laser would could send it farther, but would use more power to do so. Upon reaching the surface, the light pulses would receive would be received by a photodetector on the underside of a ship then converted back into the original photos or videos by a connected computer. From there, the files could be uploaded onto the internet via satellite. So far, the Aquify system has been used to upload and download multimedia between two computers placed a few meters apart in still water. But before it can enter real world use, though, it 
will have to be adapted to meet challenges such as the light scattering effect of swiftly moving water. Doing so may involve utilizing a spherical receiver that could detect light pulses coming in from all directions. Quote, we have received a relatively cheap and flexible way to connect underwater environments to the global internet, unquote, said the lead scientist, Association Professor Bashem Shihada. Quote, we hope that one day Aquafi will be as widely used underwater as Wi-Fi is above water, unquote. The research is described in a paper that was recently published in IEEE Communications Magazine. So who knew that there was a Wi-Fi issue underwater, huh? Well, I, I guess, you know... I another thing flash in my in my crazy brain crazy crazy brain is that uh, under this is where the underwater underwater worlds now start to exist yeah. <laughs> <laughs> speed, round. speed round speed round okay okay thanks to uh, computer world with this uh jr rafael um and in the column of android intelligence Imagine an Android Pro subscription in uh, Google's missing out a major opportunity to build its business while elevating the experience of its most enthusiastic users. So, uh, uh, so just fair warning here. Uh, he said that uh, what you're about to read is pure and adulterated longing, <laughs> and it would and it, it runs into the category "Wouldn't it be nice?" bout of daydreaming. But anyway, on the surface, at least, it does seem that a lot of awful lot of sense. And maybe, just maybe, it's something that we could see Google try to pursue in some way, someday. The ideal is all about subscriptions. Something that doesn't sound super exciting, I realize, but stick, stick with me on this, because uh, it really could have some interesting implications. Tons of tech companies are turning to subscriptions as a way to supplement revenue and keep, keep the cash coming in. Even as we gadget-carrying mammals are hanging onto devices for increasingly long time, spells and Google's getting in on that same sort of action and, and could be quite consequential. So for context, last week, Samsung launched its own subscription program in an appropriately convoluted concept called Samsung Access that lets you pay a monthly fee of 37 to $48 exchange for a current Galaxy S phone, access to Samsung's premium care program, and a Microsoft 365 subscription, along with a terabyte of OneDrive cloud storage. Within days of the announcement, news leaked that Apple could be ready, readying a bundle plan of its own for the iOS faithful, something that potentially could bring Apple TV, Apple Music, and such offerings together into a single streamlined setup with a single bill attached. And Apple's been hinting that, at that for a while now, that a broader plan to provide regular iPhone hardware upgrades along with access to pay to play Apple services could be in the works. So anyway, I, I thought just thought it was interesting that um, <laughs> we're going to go back to subscription models now. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, speed round, speed round. Yeah. All right, thanks to Mac Stories, Ryan Christoffel for this uh, story. Apple shares worldwide developer conference details. So a little more than a week away from Apple's first all online worldwide developer conference, the company today revealed the full details for how this new virtual conference format will work. While the full conference will span June 22nd through the 26th, the two biggest events will be held on kickoff day as per tradition. The special event keynote will stream directly from Apple Park starting at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time on Monday, while the platform's State of the Union will follow a few hours later at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The former will offer a wide variety of options for viewing, including Apple.com, the Apple Developer app and website, the Apple TV app and YouTube. The latter will be limited to the Apple Developer app and website. Good luck with that. Apple will also offer over 100 engineering sessions throughout the week. Rather than having these sessions at different times throughout each day as usual, Apple will instead drop a new batch of videos every day at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, while developers can view via the Apple developer app or website. Perhaps the biggest question marks about the conference have been what opportunities for interaction with Apple engineers will be made available. The company is addressing this in two days with brand new Apple developer forums and by offering reservations only one-on-one -on -one developer labs. Through forums, Apple will enable over 1,000 of its engineers to interact 
with the developer community in a more public way. While developers can get private help from an engineer through a one-on-one -on -one lab, more information will be available about how to sign up for a lab slot. For a lab slot. While this will certainly be a WWDC unlike any before, it sounds like Apple is doing everything it can to ensure developers get as much value out of the conference participation as possible. Whether you're a developer or not, that's, that's, there's surely a lot of exciting things this week will bring. Wow. Uh, I can't wait to see that. Boy, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, this It'll year. be interesting. <laughs> oh, sure. oh, my God. Okay, speed round. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, a designer envisions a detachable camera module for phones, and it's pretty cool. So um, a design firm uh, created mock renderings of a detachable smartphone camera. The camera module would pop out of the back of the phone and act as its own standalone device. The detachable smartphone camera doesn't exist, but would you want it to? So basically Yanko Design, if you really kind of follow them, they come up with these really reconceptualized products, right? And they came up with this, uh, you know, designing this thing called the Mosaic device. It's a fictional device. So don't 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 start looking for, at it at your iOS store mm -hmm. or Androids or anything like that. But um, it's a smartphone module that detaches from the body of the phone and allowing it to function as a standalone tool. So does it not only uh, function as a camera by itself, it'll also plug in your phone and you could use it uh, integrated with your phone apps to do that. So it was just kind of interesting. Um, yeah. The module they had, and, and uh, just so I can describe for the people who just have audio, it's once this module comes off, it has its own little touch screen that you could actually operate like with icons, just like you do with your phone. Put it on your phone, it'll attach phone, and then you could use the icons on the phone. So anyway, that's that's my my contribution to speed round this week. Very interesting. All right, tip time, tip time, tip time, ding, ding. All right, so uh, tip of the week is uh, five tips to brush up on your docs, sheets, and slide skills via Google. I was I figured, hey, let's just keep the theme going of Google since Greg has been writing the whole Google tip all week, you know, or the past few weeks has been tip time. Uh, this is via their G Suite uh, information. And what's really cool about it is, well, let me go through some things. Uh, you can have a dialogue in your documents with comments and suggestions is one of them. Mm. You can see new changes or restore an old version using version history. Yep, that's And cool. you can present your project virtually face-to-face -face or, you know, or virtually face-to-face. -face. You can stay productive even offline via enabling off offline mode in Google Drive. Mm. And you can bring the best real-time collaboration to Office files with their, you know, their Office editing uh, options but what i found really cool about this whole thing not just those general sort of high level five tips but at the top of the story they give you actually a popular series of short videos and we will include obviously the link to this story and, and you will see the link at the top there and you want to click that because uh it obviously goes to youtube and there's a slew of videos tutorials i mean there's gosh over a hundred of them or a hundred yeah over a hundred of them tons of them um where it looks like 152 videos of all these wonderful tips in terms of the Ooh. G Suite uh, applications and what you can do with them and how to use galore. Um, so, I mean, it's just a wonderful sort of, a, you know, uh, tool for, for everyone to get in there. And if you're, you know, you want to shore up your skills in, in G Suite or you're lacking or you're a beginner or you're an expert, there's always a little niche and something here for everyone. So I highly encourage you to check out this tip. That is so cool. That is so cool, man, man. Thank you. Thank you for another yeah, Google tip. I'll come with a maps one next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Any more tips or is that it? No, that's, that's it. it. Right? That's it. We're out. Right, yeah. I, I, I'm tipped out. Tipped out. Tipped, <laughs> tipped out. out. Yeah. yeah tipped out. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you again so much for listening and watching out there. I am Adolfo Fronda at NerdStalker on Twitter. Please check us out at NerdStalker.com, NerdStalker TV on YouTube. Obviously, you know, this podcast is all over the place. Whatever podcast uh, player you uh, that you choose of choice, just give us a thumbs up, a nice rating, and the whole thing, five stars. Subscribe, hit the bell, all of it. And Greg, where can we get a hold of you? Get a hold of me at, uh, you can uh, email me at socialgreg at nerdstalker.com or you can find me on Twitter at socialgreg and, uh, and all the above that Adolfo said uh, prior, prior to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, just a reminder, check us out again at uh, patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker TV. Uh, I mean, nerdstalker, patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. It's been one of those days. Come on, everyone. Yes. It's the day after Tongue my birthday, for goodness Tongue sake. Tongue twister. <laughs> all right. All, all right. right. I'll see you guys. Thank you, everyone. Be careful out there.